Mathematics, abstract, immutable, and as old as civilization. It's the language we use to describe and understand the world around us. From artificial intelligence and cryptography to engineering and economics, mathematics gives us the tools to predict, model, and design the increasingly complex world we live in. To progress the state of the art, every four years sees mathematicians from all over the world come together for one of the world's biggest mathematical events. Now, here in Valencia, Spain, we're ready to join the thousands of delegates attending the 2019 International Congress on Industrial and Applied Mathematics. It's ISIM 2019, and we're ISIM TV. Hello and welcome to ISIM 2019. And we're delighted to be here at the University of Valencia for this, the premier event in industrial and applied mathematics. Well, as top mathematicians from around the world in industry and academia gather here to discuss how mathematics can change and is changing the world, here on ISIUM TV, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the big issues in mathematics today. We'll talk to invited lecturers and prize winners, visit organisations from around the world, as well as hear from Congress attendees, all with the aim of getting to grips with the very latest in mathematics. Today our theme is nature and biology. From climate change to earthquakes and tsunamis, mathematicians are working hard to predict and model the impact of these phenomena. At the same time, with unprecedented knowledge about the way the human body works, we're also seeing mathematics play a growing role in modelling biological functions, from the cellular level to entire organisms. It's really basic research. It's an, an effort to help biologists to understand the inner workings of this very complicated signaling network. It certainly helps with understanding normal cell motion in development, in wound healing, as well as what happens when things go really wrong, like in cancer metastasis, for example. In our project, we are trying to apply the machine learning techniques to the uh, very skilled medical doctor decision. So we are making the decision-making supporting system for the uh, hemodialysis. Events like this one are also a great opportunity to go further, to encourage all those involved in our science and technology system to be more effective and more efficient in generating, attracting, and retaining scientific talent. And helping us along that journey, I'm delighted to be joined by our guest interviewer for the week, one of the members of the organising committee, Professor Francisco Ortegon Gallego. Well, we're delighted to be here, Francisco. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank you very much, and, uh, and welcome to Valencia and welcome to, to Spain. So, finally, we are very glad to, to have this uh, ICAN Congress uh, started. So a huge amount of work must have gone into the, to the Congress. Tell us a little bit about what's gone into it. Oh, uh, you know, uh, we've been working in the organization from, from se seven years ago. So we hope that everything will be OK. And we are very glad to, to announce that we have 4,000 delegates, which is the maximum we, ha we have ever had in this kind of Congress. And uh, we are going to have uh, more than 3,400 talks. Okay. So we, we, we are really, we really appreciate uh, and I, we, we think that uh, the, the scientific path will be, will be a success. That's, that's very exciting, of course. Um, and what are you most looking forward to? Uh, well, we'll be very satisfied if, if people are glad to be here and, and to meet another colleagues doing, doing almost the, 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 the same uh, research so, so that uh, they, 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 make, they can make a, a collaboration in the future. Well, a, a really exciting prospect for the week. We wish you the very best and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much, Sam. Good luck. Well, you can catch up more with Professor Francisco throughout the week as he gets to meet some of the world's top mathematicians. So plenty to look forward to there. Now, it might seem like the stuff of science fiction, but the impact that asteroids hitting the Earth can have is very real. 
I'm now joined by Professor Marsha Berger, who is working on modelling asteroid-generated tsunamis. Marsha, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us how likely an event is one of these tsunamis. Certainly, earthquake-generated tsunamis are much more common. There's also landslide-generated tsunamis. We've had some of those recently. And weather-related tsunamis. As far as we know, we have not had, except for the big dinosaur killing tsunamis, we have not had asteroid generated tsunamis that we've been able to measure. We've been looking at this very recently and there's really no observable data yet. How are you actually doing the studying then? Well, first we derive the equations, what changes uh, if you have a, an asteroid that, uh, for example, bursts in the sky, it generates a pressure wave. So a blast wave is what would be driving the tsunami. So that's an additional term in the modeling. But after that, it's the same software. The tsunami propagates, it approaches shore. When it gets close to shore, the, uh, it becomes more shallow, right? The, the depth of the ocean is, is much less as we approach shore. And that leads to a study of inundation. If it did reach shore, how far in would it propagate? So those are all things that we've had to do for earthquake-generated tsunamis. We use the same tools and uh, apply that in the case of asteroid-generated tsunamis. You said that hopefully they're not that likely, we don't think. But as you said, the asteroid is probably more dangerous than the tsunami itself if we're there. But how important is the work that you're doing nonetheless for coastal communities? Well, in general, the work we're doing is very important, but not just because of tsunamis. It's the same code, the same software that models tsunami propagation is also used for, example, hurricane simulations, storm surge. So we can simulate that with the same tools that say how far inland will it go, how far will it propagate. If, if it's a tsunami, you might want to know uh, what route to take to evacuate, how high do you have to go to avoid it. So it's all the same kind of simulations. That's what we do, and uh, I've now turned that software to the case of asteroid-generated tsunamis as well. In the case of airbursts, we haven't looked at the larger asteroids that will actually impact the water yet. So that'll be the next set of problems we'll look at. Well, when people talk about that in Tokyo, maybe. Okay, good one. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Marsha. Okay, thank well, you. thank you. Hopefully making us a little bit safer there, the work of Professor Marsha Berger. Well, coming up shortly, we'll be taking a look at some of the work that mathematicians are doing in sustainability, from bike sharing systems to the Amazon rainforest. First, though, a quick look at all of our in-depth features from around the world of mathematics, which you can catch all week. There are a billion people living in uh, extreme poverty. We, we see climate change and human activities really threatening our planet. Sustainability, above all, concerns human well-being and balancing environmental, economic and societal issues. Our vision has been that the same way uh, the digital re revolution and the computational science are impacting business and uh, science and many other sectors, the digital revolution could also impact key challenges concerning sustainability. The Institute for Computational Sustainability started back in 2008 with funding from uh, the National Science Foundation our idea was that uh, computational science can and should help address uh, key challenges that we face today. The goal of the Institute for Computational Sustainability is sort of a call to arms. 
how as we as a profession can use the tools that we're developing to address issues that, that integrate with, with a range of sustainable questions, and whether that be in the development of, of energy-related materials, or whether it be in natural resource planning, a, an NGO trying to think about how best it could use its resources to achieve its goals. Sustainability programs are unique in scale and complexity. Typically, we are dealing with very complex systems. We are dealing with lots of data. These problems lead to new questions in computer science, and by addressing them, we are also advancing the field of computer science. Now, compute power that we, for example, have in the lab is comparable to, let's say, maybe one-tenth of the human brain. Combined with our ability to collect millions and millions of data points about our world um, and, and machine learning capabilities has given us these new powers that, that really did not exist. The Institute for Computational Sustainability is a, a, a wide network. It brings together computer scientists, but also researchers from many other disciplines, ecologists, hydrologists, conservation planners. There's hundreds, more than 350 proposed dams in the Amazon. So it's dots all over the map. My group can generate the information on the ecology or the hydrology of these river systems, but we really can't identify how these different combinations of dams compare without this state-of-the-art computation. What we can do is identify whether or not there's some combinations of these dams right, that might be better than others. Are there some dams that, if they were built, it would completely modify the Amazon basin? A key question concerning biodiversity is how species are distributed across landscapes over time. We are developing uh, new models and uh, techniques for species distribution prediction. Our species distribution models have been used by, for example, the Nature Conservancy. Our models provide uh, good uh, predictions of when the birds fly over Sacramento Valley, and during this period, the goal is to create water habitat. The focus of our research currently is uh, accelerated materials discovery. We're trying to identify new materials and develop them so that they can be used to solve problems. We make so many materials that it is literally impossible to manually work out the thousands of samples we can make in a day and understand them. As it stands now, people use platinum in their fuel cells. Uh, that makes the fuel cells very expensive. We have, through our techniques, identified a new material that involves no platinum uh, and could serve as the basis for better and cheaper uh, fuel cell. Bike sharing systems are new technology. You have a fleet size that, that you want to uh, disperse throughout the city. You want to have bikes where people want to rent and you need to have docks where people want to park their bikes. And basically this needed a new mathematics to how to model these kinds of systems because there really wasn't a natural analog of it. We use the, the underlying mathematics of probability of, of stochastic uh, modeling so as to have a mathematical formulation to how to think about what those flows are like. It's all just a question of trying to figure out ways to either rebalance the system, to configure the system, to incentivize users. We propose that users could earn points for doing good rides. You're taking a bike from a station which has too few docks available, or dropping a bike at a station where there are too few bikes available. And this means that we have a mechanism at a much more co cost-effective way and a much more sustainable way. The U.S. power grid is rather old. We're already pushing it to the breaking point. If we have very many more people move into major metropolitan areas, we are going to start seeing failures. So one of the things that I've worked on with a couple of students is techniques that from very limited measurements give you some notion of where things are going wrong in the electrical power grid so that you can feed that into a control mechanism. We want something better. We want something that pollutes less, that ideally is robust to the types of things that we know are going to come about because of climate change. 
Computational sustainability and the digital revolution can really play a key role in addressing the sustainability challenge that you, we face today in balancing environmental, economic and societal needs. He's one of the world's top up-and-coming mathematicians working in numerical methods, applying his expertise to a wide range of real-world problems, including rock slide tsunamis and atmospheric waves. And I'm delighted now to be joined by this year's ICM 2019 Collapse Prize winner, Professor Sid Mishra. Sid, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Tell us to, to start with, what first got you interested in numerical methods? Originally, I intended to be a physicist, and then I realized pretty soon that in order to do anything useful in physics, you have to learn mathematics. And in order to solve any physics problems that arise in physics, you have to do actual computations on computers. And that's stemmed from there stemmed my interest in numerical mathematics. And how did your interest develop? It started during my PhD when I was trying to solve some problems analytically. And pretty soon I realized the limitations of just trying to use pen and paper, you have to use algorithms on a computer, and then one has to start doing numerical mathematics. And how did that lead you to avalanches and rock slides? And when I've been living in Switzerland, rock slides are a very important part of the mix there in terms of the environmental hazards. So I got talking to people who work at the avalanche center in Davos, and then they needed my expertise to solve some of their problems, and that's how you collaborate. So what are the challenges that you face and mm -hmm. some of the opportunities that you, you have? Sometimes the challenge could be that the problem that you're trying to solve is very difficult, right? And it uh, requires concentration, it requires patience, it requires ingenuity, new ideas. Sometimes there is also a barrier of uh, language, communication between the sciences. It's less between a physicist and a mathematician or an engineer and a mathematician. But if you want to work with a biologist, sometimes language can be a barrier. But in all my collaborations, I have been able to figure out a way to find the common language with which we can discuss things. And, and as we said, you're looking at real world problems. What kind of impact do you think your work is having on those problems? Some of the work that we do is very fundamental. And uh, to see its impact requires a long time. Mathematics has very long time scales. So in a time scale of a few years, probably 10 years, I'm sure it will have even wider impact than what it has today. And is that what drives you? Is it, is it the impact of your work? Is it just the maths or is it a combination of them both? I think what drives me is uh, curiosity, the interest in solving a problem, in finding interesting answers to difficult questions. If it has impact, great. If it doesn't have impact, yeah, life goes on. The sort of problems we're interested in have wide-ranging applications from astrophysics to climate science to oceanography to aerospace engineering to the design of aircraft. So there is a very broad spectrum that, uh, that is potentially able to use the work that I do. So is it a new frontier? I would say so. It depends. Others should say that, right? Uh, I would say so. I think these are some interesting ways to look at old questions but yet unsolved questions. Well, many congratulations for winning the Collatz Prize this year um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Really looking forward to seeing what Professor Mishra gets up to in the future. Now to look a bit more at the life sciences side of our theme for today as we head to the Meiji Institute for Advanced Studies of Mathematical Sciences in Japan. Researchers there are involved in a range of projects, including looking at lateral bias in organ systems, as well as determining the difference between life-like behaviour and life itself. The Meiji Institute for Advanced Study of Mathematical Sciences is an international research centre located in Tokyo, Japan. It is one of the institutes of Meiji University and its members are studying a vast range of natural and social phenomena through mathematical modelling and scientific experimentation. The official motto of our institute is math everywhere. 
By this, we mean that mathematics provides a common language for understanding a wide range of phenomena in nature and in society. Our institute was founded in 2007 under the initiative of Professor Masayas Mimura to promote cross-border research. In 2014, our institute was recognized by the Japanese government as one of four research centers of mathematical sciences in Japan. My principal background is mathematics, but at this institute, there are a broad variety of people from such disciplines as biology, chemistry, engineering, and finance. Internal seminars and symposia are held regularly, and we also host a variety of workshops proposed by researchers from all over Japan. Typically, these problems are solved in a time-independent setting. People now come from across Japan and the world to visit and discuss at our institute. In 2016, we started a new program that covers optical illusion, origami engineering, financial crisis, machine learning, and self-organization. Animal often shows left right asymmetric structure in their body. For example, human heart is biased to the left. Surprisingly, the gut of the fly is also arranged as biased as the human heart. I started collaboration with well-known experimentalist Professor Matsuno at Osaka University and trying mathematical model to explain the phenomenon observed in experiments. Professor Matsuno has a technology based on gene manipulation that can reverse the chirality of the gut of the fly. And this gives us precious information about how the system reacts to parameter change. I'm trying to improve my modeling using this information. In experiments, we can observe in detail the tissue and the cell that make up the whole gut. As a result of observation, it is known that the shell shape is different before and after the gut is twisted. Using mathematics, it is possible to explain the formation of the whole gut twist. Origami engineering seeks to develop traditional Japanese origami art and combine it with mathematical and engineering technology. We consider incorporating folding into engineering applications. We have developed products that can be stored in small spaces, making good use of the foldable feature of origami. In addition, we are researching for foldable, light and stiff origami structures as represented by the honeycomb structure. In the study of foldable plastic bottles, we use geometric relations for folding. In order to be able to fold it beautifully, thickness must be also taken into consideration and mathematical ideas are used in the process of optimization. We receive instructions from mathematics professors who specialize in geometry and mechanical engineering professors, and work with researchers from overseas as well as the Japanese to carry out projects. MIMS has the excellent research environment where you can try various things according to your challenge spirit. What is life and what is not life? I have been interested in this question for a long time, but it is a tough question. The circular objects are not living cells, but just aqueous droplets in oil. Oscillatory reaction go in each droplet and let it move in an oscillatory manner. Namely, even non-living systems can reproduce a part of the nature of living systems. Mathematical models help us understand the origin of such a lifelike behavior and clarify the kinship among the non-living and living systems. As a chemist, I'm enjoying my collaboration with good mathematicians to conduct a unique interdisciplinary sciences in this institute. Droplet motions and interfacial dynamics are a fundamental theme in the physical sciences, and as such, there is a high demand for effective computational methods across the field of applications. However, droplet and other free surface motions can be highly complex. Yet, mathematics provides us with an unbiased means through which we can describe our phenomena. 
in particular by extending the application of minimizing movements to hyperbolic free boundary problems. We have designed approximation methods which can not only solve our model equations, but which can also be used in simulations. The result is a mathematical framework which is able to describe droplet and other oscillatory interfacial motions. The researchers at our institute come from different disciplines, and we have people visiting from all over the world on a regular basis. I can therefore always find someone who is eager to discuss, and this provides me with the opportunity to exchange ideas with researchers from within Japan, as well as with people from abroad. As interdisciplinary studies are becoming more and more important, we hope our institute will continue to provide an open platform for cross-border research. We hope for the opportunity to collaborate with you in the future and to welcome you someday to Meiji University in Tokyo. Now, a cell's ability to move is driven by the movement of the proteins within it. But our next guest has discovered that the patterns that these proteins form is not at all random. Joining us now to discuss a little bit more and talk through some examples, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Leah edelstein keshet Leah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. To start off with, for those that uh, skipped biology, perhaps you could just tell us what cell motility is and how does it work? Sure. So as shown by the movie here, we're seeing a white blood cell making its way between these discs that are red blood cells. That white blood cell has to chase after pathogens. And so motility is going to be a very fundamental aspect of its function. In the work that you've been doing, what have you found to be unique and interesting about the proteins that are driving this movement? The network of proteins inside a cell is extremely complicated as shown by this diagram. We focused attention on the inner core, the regulatory hub of this tangle. And we've stripped it down to looking at one protein at a time in a model that's simple enough to analyze mathematically. And how have you been looking at this then? And what right. have you been looking for? So it turns out that these proteins get redistributed in the cell to define a front and a back. So where they're highly active, that may be the front of the cell and vice versa for the back. Now what we've done is hook together a reaction diffusion system, PDEs, that show how this happens. And we've discovered a phenomenon called wave pinning, something where the wave of activity enters the cell, sweeps towards the back, but it stops in the middle. That defines the back and the front uniquely and accounts for the polarization. And can you talk us through what's happening down here on the slide? So just this piece by itself produces this stalling wave. When you add another influence to it, whether it's the cytoskeleton, the cell structural proteins, or mechanical tension, it turns out that many different kinds of exotic patterns and waves can occur, as shown here. So what has the purpose of your research been then? It's really basic research. It's an, an effort to help biologists to understand the inner workings of this very complicated signaling network. Uh, and what will that information help the biologists with? Sure, it certainly helps with understanding normal cell motion in development, in wound healing, as well as what happens when things go really wrong, like in cancer metastasis, for example. Well, Leah, your lecture is later on in the week. Yes. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fascinating, and I think you'll have a lot of people coming after this. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. With more on cells, let's head to the University of South Carolina's Interdisciplinary Mathematics Institute, where researchers are working to better identify images of cells going through a unique form of cell death, as well as looking at everything from oceanography to electron microscopy. Think of the immense complexity of the real world. To get any kind of ordering into it, you have to be able to congregate conceptual bags that are governed by the same kind of laws. And mathematics is exactly the language that is able to do that. The IMI, the Interdisciplinary Mathematics Institute, was founded by Ron DeVore in the late 90s. What has been kept since then as a basic, important 
source of conceptual input, the notion of nonlinear approximation. Right now, I think like people are really interested in the big data. For example, like the social networks, like in Facebook, uh, the Twitters, you know, all these connect people together. And uh, we provide the tools for other people to study for them. We suggest a model called a random graph model for the semester graphs, and people refer to it as the Charm model. It's named after Dr. Chang and me. I'm interested in uh, the development of advanced algorithms for accelerating large-scale numerical simulation uh, for real-world problems, especially uh, in fluid problems. Uh, for instance, uh, we are currently working closely with uh, uh, scientists uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory on ocean modeling. The ocean models we are developing has uh, dramatically different spatial and temporal scales. That brings bigger challenges uh, in computation. So we developed a conservative explicit local time stepping that makes it possible to run long-term simulation on highly variable, high resolution meshes. Nonlinear approximation plays an important role in conjunction with other fields like harmonic analysis and above all numerical analysis. But a key component of it is it provides a framework where you can keep the discrete problem, which is actually transferred to the computer, in close connection with the underlying continuous model. Because that allows you to eventually exploit intrinsic problem metrics, which are lost when you, when you, when you forget about the underlying continuous model. And this is at the heart of many, many applications in diverse areas like machine learning, compressive sensing, imaging, data analysis, and seemingly very different, even in the numerical treatment of PDEs. A team of biologists and biochemists at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, asked me about work that they're doing in uh, an area known as netosis. They have mountains of microscope images of cells undergoing netosis under various kinds of experimental conditions. We decided to collaborate on developing a model to automate the process of localizing, labeling, segmenting cells in their images. It's possible to develop convolutional neural networks and other machine learning techniques, models to uh, perform image segmentation and instant segmentation, object recognition and detection in the images in order to answer their questions about which agonists cause the most netosis, what sort of phenotype changes one sees when netosis occurs, what phenotypes accompany netosis, etc. One of the big pluses in working at AMI is that uh, nearby there is a nanocenter and electron microscope. With the um, advancement in the quality of the, of the signal we have, you now are noticing the effect of the instrumentation itself on the data that you collect. And now the questions become, the changes that I see in this image, are they real to my sample or are they driven by my measurement technique? And the mathematicians have been able to help us develop a formalism where we can acquire a series of images and then register them pixel by pixel, um, allowing us to extract higher quality data from effectively very low signals and noise input data. One of the new problems we're working on is uh, electron dispersive uh, X-ray tomography. Uh, this is a way of identifying the individual elements into the sample. We have to develop a special uh, learning theory approach to be able to extract the information and we have much better results now than the standard processing techniques. We have really profited enormously from interactions with mathematics in the sense that 
uh, they taught us how to carefully look at noise, model noise, understand noise, and get better data that allows us then to also question our own premises with respect to imaging. The main underlying theme is to connect foundational research and theory to cutting-edge applications. In doing so, it's important to always remain open to look at things from a new angle. Well, now it's time to hand over to our resident mathematician, Professor Ortegon, as he sits down with Professor Hiroshi Sorito to look at the intersection of geometry and anatomy. Professor Sorito, welcome to this edition of ECM. Can you give us an outline of your invited talk? I am going to talk about the cardiovascular problems. It's a collaboration with the medical doctors. At the very beginning, when you, uh, when you uh, first talked with, with them, were they, they reluctant to, to, to yes. collaborate with a mathematician? Yeah, yes, actually, in the, in the very beginning of the Arab collaboration, they are very reluctant, and maybe they didn't trust mathematicians. <laughs> but now, after the long collaboration, the long discussions, and we are, we are trying to set uh, proper clinical questions, now we are collaborating happily with them. In, in your talk, you are going to talk about the thoracic aorta. Yes. So, uh, what is uh, the detailed geometry of, uh, of your numerical simulation? Our target is aorta, thoracic aorta, mm -hmm. and there are several branches. Mm -hmm. So, we set the inflow boundary conditions and outflow boundary conditions, and also thinking about the fluid structure interaction. And mm -hmm. then it gives us the outcomes and the prediction of the diseases after several years. So your, your modeling is a uh, Navier-Stokes equation with a uh, non-Newtonian no, no fluid, that's a non-Newtonian fluid. For, yes, in the aorta we use the Newtonian fluid because it's a very large artery. Yes. Of course, in the smaller arteries we need to use the non-Newtonian non fluid. Uh -huh. In our projects, we are trying to apply the machine learning techniques mm -hmm. to the uh, very skilled medical doctor's decision so we are making the decision-making supporting system for the uh, hemodialysis medication problems. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for medical doctors, but the artificial intelligence can learn the very skilled doctors. Then they give a very good uh, decision-making support. Apart from clinical uh, medicine applied, using mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, what other topics have you in your laboratory? So we are now collaborating with other material scientists and making some researches from the very nanoscale to the macro scales, like the bio, bio materials. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Suito. Thank I you. I hope that you will enjoy this week in the, in the development of the ICM. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've taken a look at how mathematicians are working to save lives and to save the world. But now, as ICM 2019 gets underway, it's time for a little bit of excitement. We stopped by this morning's opening ceremony to hear from some of Spain's top mathematicians, as well as from the king himself. Well, I came from Santiago de Compostela. Uh, my area are numerical methods for hi hyperbolic problems with different applications. I work in uh, Madrid and I work in numerical analysis, so solving uh, problems with the computer. I have come uh, from India to present a paper in mathematics, fuzzy optimization techniques. I'm uh, looking forward to meeting uh, many people I know for many years, many friends from over the world, and of course uh, keeping abreast with new developments in the field. My PhD is completed and I'm looking for a postdoc, so it will be a platform to have a contact with more delegates. It's a very nice meeting point for young people, also for seniors. Take face to face with people that uh, you admire very much. I think that is a big opportunity for all of us. We feel extremely honored to have His Majesty the King here with us today.
you find yourself at the perfect time and place to learn about new mathematical tools, exchange ideas. Welcome to the thrilling challenge of shaping the world with mathematics. Welcome to ECM 2018 Valencia Congress. Mathematics is everywhere and unavoidable in the development of new technologies and in the advancement of our societies. The Congress is a moment of discussion, reflection, and perspective. These days, we will prepare the future. Spanish mathematics, I am not an expert in the field, allow me to admit. But I do know that Spanish mathematics is enjoying a remarkable good health. Spanish research centers have led the Spanish mathematical research to rank seventh in the world by number of citations. Events like this one are also a great opportunity to go further, to encourage all those involved in our science and technology system to be more effective and more efficient in generating, attracting, and retaining scientific talent. A prestigious start to a very important event there. Well, that's the end of our first show of day one of ISIUM 2019, but there's plenty more to come. Tomorrow we'll be taking a closer look at our next big theme, social networks and finance, and everything in between. So make sure that you catch up with our show tomorrow. It's online and on TVs right here on campus, and even in a few select Valencia hotels. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>